Sylvia D'Amelio with us today. She's the CEO of Trout Unlimited Canada. She's our conservation specialist. Uh, she was with us before, and now she's going to be tying so wonderful selection of wet flies with her. I coaxed her into tying with us and bringing her back soon. And she's taken a lot of time out of our busy schedule, so we're fortunate to have her. And um, I just want to say thank you, Sylvia, for taking the time to tie with us. Take it away. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic, it's been a long time since I've been able to, to tie with you guys. So um, it's kind of nice to connect again and, and have a chance to chat fish, chat fishing. Um, a lot of you guys know me, you know, I can chat fishing all day long and all night long. So, um, it's also really kind of nice to do this out of my fly tying room at my, at my bench here where I've got, you know, everything I need. And, and, um, you know, if we get into talking about other materials, um, you know, we can talk about them and I can show you, uh, you know, the materials I use. Um, I know a lot of you guys like to talk about storage. Uh, and management of materials, we can talk about that too. It's all laid out behind me here. Um, it's uh, the only room in the house that has its own alarm system, not by design. This used to be a, an office for a, a subcontractor. We thought, well, isn't that fitting? So it has its own alarm system in here. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. We're going we're gonna to talk wet flies today. Um, and you know, wet flies do not need to be complicated. There, there's a lot of very simple patterns and, and the two go-tos for me, the absolute must-haves in my fly box and the two flies I will pull out every time I go to fish is a partridge in orange, which you should all have heard of, right? And a little greeno, which most of you haven't heard of, no doubt. Um, and those are the two flies that I'm going to tie here tonight. Now, how many of you, by show of hands, by thumbs up, or emoji on your screen, fish wet flies? So a few of you. How many of you fish them on the swing? Quite a few. How many with shot? A few less. All right. How many of you fish them when there's a dry fly hatch going on? Ah, there's the smart guys right there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about fishing, fishing wet flies. My rule of thumb uh, for, for fishing when I go to a river, um, for those of you that know me, there is, there's no technique, legal technique, um, that I haven't tried or used at the right time. So I'm not a, a dry fly fanatic, I'm not a nymph fanatic, I'm not a hardware fanatic, but I'm outfitted for everything and I use it all at the right time. And so, um, I'll give you an example. I was fishing down uh, in, in the Castle Park area on the South Castle River with a good friend. And um, we started out the morning. The water was cold, brutally, brutally cold, mountain fed stream. Um, and I immediately put a nymph on and I started nymphing. The fish, if you, crystal clear water, you could see them hugging bottom 10, 20 feet down. They were not moving, they were not interested, right? It's like first thing in the morning on a Saturday when it's snowing out. I'm like, yeah, not, not quite interested. Coffee's not made yet. Um, and so you really had to work for them and you had to get, you had to get in front of them. They weren't on the move. As the weather warmed up as that, and this is what happens in, a, in Alberta quite a bit, the sun hits the water, temperatures spike and, and you know, those trout have a very small window to get active. The bugs have a small window and a hatch starts coming off. The friend of mine that I was fishing with was dry fly fishing from the moment we got there. And of course, nothing is near the surface. So he's, he's dry fly fishing, not having a great morning. Um, I'm able to pull out cuts and bowls, no problem, nymphing, that's great. But then those fish start rising in the water column. And if you watch them, if you stop fishing and you sit back and you watch the behavior of animals, they start moving and shifting. They move and shift with temperature, they move and shift with position of the sun, um, with movement of animals, of their, of their prey items. So they started moving up in the water column as bugs started coming off. And so all of a sudden my buddy was, was hooking into some fish. For me, my next move is a wet fly. It's not a dry fly. And it doesn't matter how much of a hatch is coming off, because if you think about the biology of fish, in most cases, in many cases, the large fish are loath to come straight to the surface. And so you'll get the smaller, younger fish that are all excited because there's, there's mayflies on the surface or there's caddis on the surface or whatever's hatching. And they'll take them quite aggressively and you can have a really great day. Those larger fish, the fish that have got a couple degrees under their belt, that have seen a few flies, that have seen a few predators, are not quite as aggressive, not quite as apt to come to the surface. And what they'll do is they'll take those uh, nymphs as they're approaching the surface. 
the animals that are coming through the water column as they're coming up. And this is at the beginning of the hatch. This isn't the case for an entire hatch. So when the hatch is starting, if you can start with a wet fly and swing at the right point in the water column, for me anyway, my average size is higher than if I'm fishing with a dry fly. As the hatch wears on and gets stronger and stronger, um, that, that, that visual cue, what those larger trout are looking for, becomes the larger, the, the adult um, bug that's coming off the surface and they'll, they'll start rising and then I switch to a dry fly. I make a lot of changes. I change my fly a lot to follow the fish through the water column. As the hatch dies off, I don't go back to a wet fly, I go straight back to nymphs again, right? Because that hatch dying off doesn't, means that there's no longer as many bugs in the water column, the fish are moving back down, temperature's dropping, and I head right back down to the bottom with nymphs again. So knowing that, I have to have quite a few things in my fly, fly box at the ready at any given time. I've got to have a selection of nymphs that mimic or attract. I've got to have a selection of wet flies that uh, mimic and that I can use at different points in the water column and a selection of dries that can mimic or in the case of Alberta, attract. Um, yes. Could you just explain to us, because for, um, just in case we have any beginners coming in, the difference, when you, what you mean by when you say on the swing? Uh, on the swing. So, um, when, um, when I fish wet flies, how do I describe this? When I'm fishing wet flies, um, I tend to fish downstream. I cast sort of, depending on water speed, let's say at a 45 degree angle um, to my right or to my left, and I allow that fly line to swing through the water column. What happens is the wet fly with weight on it will sink, and as it hits the current and the fly line starts straightening out and there's tension in the fly line, that fly will start to rise in the water column. And this is the gold mine right here, that rise at the bottom of the swing. That, that sweep is referred to as the swing. Right at the end though, there's a hang and the hang is golden. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you, you throw your fly in and if you're cutthroat fishing, you'll get that odd cutthroat that goes, ooh, there's a, there's a fly and takes it anyway. But that's, that's the rare point. You allow that to swing through. And as it comes up in the water column, depending on where you are in the hatch, and depending on the size of fish, you'll catch as that fly is coming up. Then where most people miss opportunities is as the fly comes up, they pick up and they cast again. That's great, but you're missing a critical piece and that's the hang. So right at the end of the swing, as that fly comes up, just pause it, just let it sit there. And then what I like to do is just take my line and give it a little tug back and forth, micro tug, quarter of an inch, right? A little twitch here and there. And, and I will say, probably half my fish on the swing come on that hang. And that's typically because, question, go for it. Uh, yes, yeah, Sylvia, do you ever uh, use a wet fly uh, and cast it upstream? We were on the Lancaster River once and my friend Chris, who's with us tonight, he was catching all kinds of fish by casting upstream with his wet. And I was catching sweet, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. You can, you can cast up, upstream and catch. I think the reason I spend 99% of my time casting downstream is you feel the take. You really do. It's, it's really quite electric. Um, they're aggressive. You're directly in line with your fly, especially on the hang. Um, and it can definitely make that, that fish seem larger than it actually is on that take. Um, so there's a, there's a satisfaction in that swing, that downstream swing that I like. But you absolutely can catch them casting upstream. You also, um, I find for me, I lose more fish casting upstream because I'm not directly in line with the fly, right? So, I, I mean, I know where my weaknesses are. Um, there's more slack in the line. There's more line to manage. Um, it, it's the same thing with dry flies. I, I have some challenges on a really good day with dry flies because I get overexcited and, you know, I, I pull it right out of their mouths. You got to know where your weaknesses are. Um, but yeah, you absolutely can. You, you absolutely can cast upstream. Um, for me, 99% of the time, it's going to be a downstream, downstream cast. Any other questions about the swing? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, <clears throat> so when you're hanging the fly there, are you changing the way you set hook at all when you do get the strike? I'm sorry, say again? <clears throat> are you changing the way you set hook on the fish when you get striked? I, I don't set the hook. Not on the, not on the, um, not on the hang? Not on the hang. I mean, it's already, you're, you're already pretty tight. Unless it's in slack water, then yeah, it's the same set. It's no big difference. Um, 
but on the hang, they typically, they're, they're taking, they're coming upstream, they're taking the fly and turning back. They hook themselves. You're into a fight. You're done. So, yeah. I mean, as long as you've got a sharp hook, you're fine. So I'll, I'll give you another example of where this was uh, golden for me. Uh, fishing the Upper Old Man, um, I, I took um, a woman, she's a professor in BC, um, and she hadn't caught uh, cutthroat before. And we went to the Upper Old Man and, and there was a hatch coming off, there was a mayfly coming off, and you know all, there was all kinds of little cuts coming to the surface. And people were catching them like, I'll get out. I started swinging wet flies and on my first trip, I got a 21 inch cut. And so I went over, switched her fly up, and on her second drift, she got a 20 inch cut. I don't think she's fished a dry fly since. Now that doesn't mean dry flies don't work, they absolutely do, and in the peak of a hatch, believe me, I'm on dries. Um, but that lead up, that front end, uh, there's definitely a shift in, in that population of fish. There's a, there's a size shift in who's feeding where at the front end. So pace to watch. All right, should we get into some flies? All right, let's talk hooks. Um, I'm, I'm gonna show you my favorite hook, but I'm not going to tie on it just from a size perspective. I'm gonna tie on something a little bit bigger. Um, but my all time favorite, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a big fan of Daiichi hooks. I'm a big fan of Alec Jackson hooks. And this is the Alec Jackson soft tackle. I think it's called the crystal soft. Let me see if I can get it in there. So there's the Alec Jackson uh, soft. And I don't know if you can tell, but it's a very, very light wire hook, um, which makes it very light in the water column, gives it a lot of movement. Um, what I'm gonna be tying on tonight and what is a little bit uh, more uh, typical of the gauge of wire that you'll see in wet fly hooks, this is a hammock. Just to give you a comparison, there we go. So let me put them side by side here. You can see the difference in, um, in weight. So make no mistake, I mean, I tie on these classic wet fly hooks, there's no doubt about that, but my favorite are these Alec Jackson Crystal Softs. They, um, the hook practically disappears in the water column. They're very light, so you have more movement, but like I said, they're also, they're small, and um, I don't have the larger sizes, so I'm not gonna mess around with that today to show you these flies. So, um, for the partridge, we're going to start with a partridge in orange. Partridge in yellow, partridge in green, all the same deal. I do this with three materials, thread, dubbing, and a, and a feather. That's it. Um, no rib. So, what I'm using here is uh, fluorescent orange thread. It's a uni, can we see that? Uni 140. The reason I'm using 140 is because I don't put floss on this. So I'm going to use the thread as my body. So it's one less step. It's a leaner body, less material. Um, no rib. I don't put a rib on this. Uh, this is a fly that we sort of production tie and, and just get, you know, however many dozen we can out there. Wrap back and then wrap forward. Now the trick to keeping a nice flat body with this uni thread is unwinding it. It's a multi, um, it's a multi-fiber thread. So if you want, it doesn't have to have a perfectly flat body. This is where my OCD kicks in. Um, you can just keep wrapping forward. This, the, this is me. I like to flatten the thread and have that nice, lean, flat body that's uniform all the way to the front. So there's the body, material number one. Really complex fly. For those of you who joined me for the soggy bog, you're in a whole nother ball game now. So uh, the next piece of of this puzzle is to put a small, um, you can use a, a thread dam to create a ball of thread. Um, what you're looking for is a ball that the hackle fibers will pulse against, that will, that will create a bit of a, a dam against the fibers. What this does is it helps trap air in the fibers and between the body and the fibers, and it gives a very realistic look of a, an emerging bug, which would have a, an air bubble in it. Yeah? Okay. Well, you know I'm not going to, those of you who know me, you know I'm not going to use thread. You know I'm going to use dubbing. Any opportunity to use dubbing. I use one of two dubbings, either a natural, natural rabbit. Let me get it out of the glaring light here. Um, or uh, this is ice dub uh, holographic golden orange. It's basically a rusty brown, right? Um, 
when I'm feeling terribly creative because the fish really notice, I blend the two together. Is any of that necessary? No, it's absolutely not. All you're looking for is a little bit of a dam. Um, this is a fly where less is more. Too much dubbing, too thick of a body, too many hackles, and you don't get that air bubble, you don't get that pulsing and that movement of material that makes it look light, lifelike in the water column. Make sense? I keep looking around at all the faces on the screen. I must look like I'm losing my mind as my eyes bug around. <laughs> all right. So I'm just gonna take a tiny bit of material and you can just wrap this on your thread, put those back on. Um, for me, I'm gonna split the thread. It's just what I always do. This is just a habit, but it's really not necessary. All right, I heard, uh, I heard questions, go for it. Um, what are your thoughts on traditional silks like the Parasol 6P or 19 as opposed to the, um, using the uni thread or the ultra? Love them. Absolutely love them. I've had a lot of, um, a lot of partridge and orange, partridge and yellows with them. Absolutely. Um, or do you prefer the bright color of the uh, uni thread? I haven't found personally, I haven't found a difference in success. So, um, do they work? Absolutely. I think there's flies where, um, that would maybe, or you would have more of an impact of the silk, if that makes sense. Um, I've done flosses. I have flosses sitting right on the table to use, and I don't know why I pulled them out because I'm going to show you the fly the way I tie it. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times when I do these demos, we do, I do floss, I do silk, but if I'm being really honest, this is how I tie a fly. This is the fly that I would fish with. It's no different than, you know, when, when tying coronamids, um, you know, you can tie in wing buds. Does it look dramatically different? Yes. Have I seen difference in success? No, so I don't bother. I'll tie them in for demos. Um, and there's no doubt that there, there is a difference visually. But for me, the question is, am I realizing greater success with that than without? I personally haven't seen a difference. Um, I think I saw Jack's comment there. I know Jack likes the silk. Silk can go more translucent in the water. Absolutely it can. I just don't think that on, on the take, as a bug is coming up through the water column that that fish is checking. Um, do I ever tie wet flies with, with a reverse hackle? Um, only for tankera fishing, which I've never done. I've tied the flies, but I've never done it yet. And I've got a rod sitting there waiting. I just haven't gotten to it yet. So in this case, I've just blended a little bit of each dubbing. Again, overkill for the record, definitely overkill. All you need is a little bit of dubbing. Um, typically, Maybe I'll just use a little bit of rabbit or whatever I've got on the tying bench. Um, in reality, you're not going to see a whole heck of a lot of it. So a couple wraps, um, and then I just pull out whatever's left. And it's okay if it's messy. That's not a problem in the least. Now I'm going to fold those fibers back and a couple turns at the front. Uh, then you get your trusty partridge skin and pick out a feather. Now. There's two lengths, I'll tie this. I'll tie this with the hackles uh, halfway down the shank and I'll tie it with the hackles all the way down the shank, uh, but not longer than the, the shank, not, not past the bend of the hook. Um, everybody again has you know, different views on how to tie this. I'm just prepping my feather here by stroking those fibers back. For those of you um, who I've tied with in the past, when, when putting uh, a hackle at the front end of a fly, you'll know that I, I bend the hackles back, I fold the shaft of the feather and uh, fold them all back, or I'll strip one side. In the case of this fly, I'm just prepping this feather here. In the case of this fly, I don't bother. Uh, messy is good. So what I've done is I stroked those, let me get that in view. I've stroked those fibers back, snipped off the tip, and, uh, and cut back some of the fibers. Now it's very messy and uneven. That the intent here is to have the thread grab those, um, those little stumps. Make sense? Awesome. Okay, so now I'm gonna tie this in. I tend to put it under the hook at a 45 degree angle, a loose wrap, which I missed. Fun tying with the camera between you and the hook and two or three wraps there. Now, um, this is a point 
or he and a lot of you know I, I'm not a big fan of head cement, but if you're new to tying these, I would suggest put a drop of head cement there. Just a moment there. Just to keep it in place. Now, um, this is also where I would switch threads, which I'm doing right now, um, to a 70. And the main reason is this this um, thicker thread that I've got on there right now that uh, we've we've used for the body. Um, I'm just going to switch over here. Um, that thicker thread that we've used for the body is, is actually going to be quite challenging when it comes to whip finishing at the front end, and we're going to skip over that eye. Um, just switching over to the thinner thread and looking for my hackle pliers. Um, and so now we've got the thread in place, uh, the thinner thread in place. Uh, you can strip these, uh, these sort of uh, light fibers. I don't bother simply because I'm only going to do about two or three wraps. You can get your hackle pliers or whatever you use to hold on to um, the feathers or your wire and I just fold back. Again, I'm not worried about messiness because messiness is actually going to help with the creation of those air pockets. So I'm just pulling those back as I wrap. I only typically do about two wraps, two and a half maybe. And the main reason is you can over hackle these things. And we're just gonna tie that off elegantly, I hope with the camera between my hands here. There we go. Snip this off. Typically use a razor blade to snip these off, but if I'm being really honest, I don't trust myself with a camera. The iPhone between me and the uh, fly and a razor blade, so scissors it is. And then a quick whip finish. I carry these in orange, uh, a rusty orange, yellow, and green. And that's it. There's your partridge in orange, using three materials. Now, again, you can make this much more complicated. Um, a lot of folks use uh, gold rib on it. Uh, I have done trailing shucks um, before, just at the back end. Again, haven't seen a big difference in productivity. Um, you can put a dubbing head on it. There are a lot of things that you can do to this fly, but if I'm being honest, this is what I fish. Three materials, that's it. I can churn these out by the dozen pretty quickly with a bunch of different colors, just using thread. Um, and given how quickly um, you can tie them, I'm really not worried about how long they last, right? Something like the soggy bog um, that, that takes me quite some time. I'm tying for durability. I want that thing to withstand some teeth, right? The musky, the pike, the bass. I, I want it to be able to withstand some, um, some, some, you know, attacks. In this case, it doesn't matter. In this case, I'm just, I'm, I'm pumping out quite a few of them. What right. size is a hook would you tie this fly in? What size? So this is a 12. This is as large as I would go. So uh, 12, 14, 16. Probably the majority that I would fish would be 14s if I'm, if I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I'm tying 12s right now just so it's easier for you guys to see. And this would be great with uh, cutthroat trout or, or a whole range of trout? Trout. Right. Trout. Okay. Probably the only trout I, I haven't used it on and I probably wouldn't bother is bull trout. You don't get a lot of bull trout rising for flies. It's Do you prefer to hackle a little heavier than the traditional spider tie with a one or two, one and a half turns? And also, do you, use, you seem to use the darker hackle from the, uh, from the partridge as opposed to the... Um, I use both. Part? Use both. I use both. Yeah, I've got lights and darks. Haven't seen a big difference again in productivity between the light and the dark, as long as it's barred. So I tied some with a saddle hackle that wasn't as barred and, and I didn't find it to be as, as productive. Um, so as long as it's barred, I didn't, I didn't find it to be a big deal. This is a little bit of a heavy, heavy hackle, but I don't think it's a big deal. You just, you don't want to pull the feather on, right? 
You don't right. want to be putting that whole feather on. You want, you want it to be sparse. You want it to be able to trap air. And for the trout to be able to see those air bubbles, those air pockets, the translucency of those air, air bubbles and air pockets is important. And for those of you who tie chironomids, you know, that's why we put all these mylars on your chironomids because you're mimicking that, those air pockets as the, um, as the, 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 blood in the body changes of your midge, just the chronomid as it's emerging to a midge starts to shift and it, and it gains air pockets as it starts to go up through the water column. Um, you know, you, you change the ribbing on it so that you can mimic some of those, those air pockets at iridescence. The little greeno, I'm going to show you this fly. Um, the little greeno is a fly my husband developed right before the Canadian championships in Ontario many, many years ago. Um, it is a uh, pheasant bodied soft tackle with an or with a green dubbed uh, thorax behind it um, and a small trailing shuck of, uh, of crystal flash. This is a simple tie um, and it's a very, very, very productive fly. Um, it was extremely productive in the days leading up to the championships. And of course, by the time the championship started, lost its luster after every trout had seen it. So, um, Let's start tying this fly. Um, this, this fly has been very, very productive on the Grand, upper and lower. Uh, we use this like in that Paris to Brantford drift. For size, for today, we'll tie on this. Um, I'm just putting some thread, new thread in my uh, bobbin here. We're gonna be using, or I'm gonna be using um, a UTC Olive uh, 70. Can we get focused maybe? There we go. So I'm going to be using an olive colored uh, thread. All right. We'll wind this thread back. I'm just going to snip that off. Three uh, pieces of crystal flash just tied in right on top of the fly. Or right on top of the shank of the hook, I should say. A few wraps. I'm just going to get rid of some of this bulk. There we go. Um, this is ribbed uh, mainly because I don't trust pheasant tail. So we're going to use a um, small gold wire in this case, and this will be counter ribbed. So here's our small gold wire. It's going to be tied in uh, at the top, just next to the crystal flash. You'll notice I don't tie all the way back again in the case of the crystal flash and the wire, just a couple of wraps to hold that in place. Um, and this comes from my, my chronomid um, tying and Atlantic salmon tying, where bulk is an issue. Um, and I'm con constantly trying to reduce bulk. So this is just really habit, but you can, um, you can move it and you can tie that thread forward and back again to tie all those pieces in. Um, I just, like I said, don't, don't really see it as being too necessary. So three to four fibers of pheasant tail. So here's our, whoa, here's our pheasant tail. I'm gonna tie them in by the tip, tip facing forward towards the eye of the hook. And I'm just going to catch them. And wrap all the way forward. And each of these wraps is gonna be side by side because this is now where I am tying in and securing all the materials. Now I'm ready to build that fly. So uh, take my hackle pliers. I'm losing all my tools here today. So to wrap the pheasant tail, um, what I do is I bring those pheasant tail fibers up and then I hook them right at the very top with either my hackle pliers or these electrical clips. Your first two wraps do not pull tight. You will snap these right out. So these are light wraps side by side, two, maybe three of them. And then you can start wrapping a little bit tighter. But you will snap these right off, right at the base, if you're not careful and you pull these too tight. You want to make sure you're getting your pheasant tail at the base because you need these to be fairly long. You want to wrap all the way up to about two, um, two maybe uh, hook eyes behind. Um, and then you can either wrap your way back to tie it off, or if you're like me, unwrap your way back to tie it off. 
Again, this is totally unnecessary. This is just my habit. I wrap backwards until, or I unwrap until I can no longer move back, and then I tie it off. And never for me, it's never more than two reps. Snip that off. So there's our body. And then I'm going to take this wire and I'm going to counter wrap that a few times. Now I'm not doing this because I think the rib is important uh, from a visual perspective. I'm doing this to reinforce the pheasant tail. And then again, I wrap back once. Well, I can't, I'm back all the way already. And then two wraps on the wire, one wrap in front and snap off that wire in the wrong spot. Good job. There we go. So there's our body so far. That tail's a little long, so I'm gonna, my trailing shuck is long, so I'm just gonna snip that off. We don't want that to be very long at all. And there's our body so far. How's everybody doing? We're good? Um, do I ever put adhesive underneath pheasant fibers? No, it's an added step. Um, you know, for those of you who've tied with me before, I get rid of other steps. Um, I don't, um, any errant fibers are gonna go regardless. You won't be able to glue down all those pheasant fibers, so I, I really don't bother. Um, but you can, absolutely, why not? If that works for you um, and, it, and it gives you confidence in your flies, then you should absolutely do it. So in this case, it's a very particular color my husband has chosen. Uh, this is Ice Dub Caddis Green. Now, there we go, out of the light a little bit. Um, it's a very light green, it's iridescent, it's got, um, it's got a lot of translucency to it, but again, very, very little used, very little. This is just to give it a little bit of color underneath those fibers. All right, again, put the, um, put the dubbing on in any way you're comfortable. For me, it's splitting thread. You can just wrap it around. You can create a dubbing loop. You can say it's splitting thread and then fail to do it in front of a camera. Um, it's a good camera you have, Sylvia. It's my iPhone. <laughs> oh, it's your iPhone. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a great app called uh, Epic Cam. Um, and it allows me to zoom in and zoom out and it's continuous focus. I'm, I'm a big fan of it for this sort of thing. Sorry, how do you spell that? I'll, I'll send the link around. Okay. I'll send the link to you guys. It's a, it's a really great, um, it's the, the free version is like anything else. It's low resolution, but, um, but this is kind of neat because it allows you to zoom in and zoom out and it's high res, um, which is kind of nice. Um, and like I said, continuous focus. So, uh, which means I don't have to keep checking to see if it's in focus. So I'm gonna wrap that two, three times and then pull off all the excess. So there we go, there's the, that thorax. One wrap to two wraps in front and we're ready for the uh, hackle. Um, yeah, this, this was a, a really great find. The pro version that I'm using, I think is $12, one time buy, well worth it, well worth it. Um, okay, so two options for the hackle on this fly. It has a dark hackle. Um, you can use a uh, hen saddle, absolutely. Or what, um, what we've taken to using, and it doesn't work any better, it's just a great use of, of feathers that don't usually get used, um, is the back end of jungle cock. Um, so back in my Atlantic salmon tying days, I have all these jungle cock capes um, and these back end fibers are very rarely used for anything. Um, and I was tying uh, Atlantic salmon one day and Dave said, well, I can do something with that. And he tied this fly. Um, so this has now been the use for our, the back end of our jungle cock capes. But we do also tie it with a hen saddle without any problem. You wanna pick a feather where the hackles will extend down a portion of the fly, but not cover that trailing shuck, those crystal, um, the, uh, crystal flash fibers. It's, uh, it's interesting having two people who are obsessive fly fishers and fly tires in the house. There's often competition for materials here. Um, and uh, when I ordered my Hannah hooks, I put them at the back of the hook drawer. I hid them right at the very back. And I was away for one week of work and I came back and I went to take them out to tie some check nymphs and they were gone. Three quarters of them just used and I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, 
how did how was it you dug at the back of that drawer and he said well i was looking for something to do and i saw these new hooks and so he tied purple coronamids on my hammocks a fly that's rarely used so it was really quite uh, quite upsetting the dilemmas that you have in a fly tying house so uh, i'm gonna prep the hackle in the same way so i'm folding those fibers back trimming the tip off and then trimming the fibers on either side to create a bit of a comb on either side, um, something for that thread to grab onto. So back to our fly, get all these fibers off my fingers, going to lay that, um, that stem underneath and grab it with a couple of wraps couple to three wraps. Um, again, if you're new to this, put a dot ahead cement there because I guarantee nine out of 10 times you will pull that fiber right out as soon as you start wrapping it. Interesting barring, if you can call it barring on this feather, this jungle cop feather. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not sure that it makes much of a difference. Um, the feathers that we're typically using for this when we're not using uh, that jungle cock is a modeled uh, hen saddle. Um, I think anything that's got some contrast in it is, is really what makes the difference. So let's, let's wrap that in. Don't forget your dot of head cement. When I used to teach these flies in person, that was where 90% of it went wrong. So not a bad idea to do. That first pull and that, that feather comes right out. All right, so we're a little bit longer now. We're gonna wrap this around two, three times. That's better. So there's our second wrap. And tie that off. If you notice, every, every time I tie something off, it's, it's two wraps to hold it in place, two wraps in front. And then I typically unwrap one to tie my next material in, two wraps to hold it in place, two wraps in front, untie one, unwrap one, and, and do it all over again. So uh, a little bit of a whip finish, probably gonna need a razor blade there later to clean that up. Put a whip finish on on the head, three, four turns, and we are done. Now, these uh, trailing fibers from the the dubbing we leave in place just to add a little bit of contrast in color. So that is the little green up.